Today we'll be reading through RFC 6238, Time-Based One-Time Password Algorithm. So the abstract reads, this document describes an extension of the one-time password algorithm. The hash-based one-time password algorithm specifies an event-based OTP algorithm where the moving factor is an event counter. And let's answer this question before moving on. What is the event counter in a hash-based one-time password? The event cal uh, counter is a moving factor. But here, the present work bases the moving factor on a time value. So what is a moving factor here? A time value. Well, a time-based variant of the OTP algorithm provides short-lived OTP values which are desirable for enhanced security. So I'm saying here, this is so much easier to read after answering the uh, two previous questions. Some of these RFCs can melt your brain, but if you piece them apart like I'm trying to do here, I think it's uh, better. It's a better experience for all. You, the reader, and then the authors in which you will have access to their email address at the end of this, so maybe you can more positively reach out to them. And before we go too far, uh, the RFCs and standards that relate to this one, 1760 is the S forward slash key one-time password system. 1760 is quite a while ago. RFC uh, 2289, though, uh, a little more recent, a one-time password system. Uh, we just read about 4226, and then 6238 is the one we're literally reading right now. Well, the proposed algorithm can be used across a wide range of the network applications. Now, don't worry, I won't be reading the whole thing. Uh, just the abstract, though, is a pretty uh, good one. Even though this is a TLDR, uh, you gotta read the whole abstract. So the proposed algorithm can be used across a wide range of network applications from remote virtual private uh, network access and Wi-Fi network logon to transaction-oriented web applications. The authors believe that a common and shared algorithm will facilitate adoption of two-factor authentication on the internet by enabling interoperability across commercial and open source implementations. So speaking of VPN, this video is sponsored by... Okay, I'm just kidding. But this right here, if you didn't know what this RFC was all about, well now you do. They're proposing an algorithm here. So I skipped the stuff um, in the status of memo and copyright. I just took it out and put that little red text there. The first part of the introduction talks about this document describing an extension of the one-time password. So here's a good joke to help you remember why the T is in front of OTP, because it's for extension. That's the best I got. And this extension is an extension to, namely, the HMAC-based one-time password. And since that is true, I wonder why they didn't call this ThoughtP then. Or if you hang out with high schoolers like I do for my day job, you know that they don't want to call it Thought because Thought is a really inappropriate thing. I forget exactly what it stands for, but I know it is uh, It's a teenager thing. But to focus here, I found a pretty good picture to help anybody who's new to this maybe wrap their mind around the idea of using a counter as a um, moving factor there. So I'll let you pause on the picture to go ahead and, you know, digest that, uh, the code right there. I think that that makes uh, this part, the truncate part, make a little more sense, I think. Um, they say that as defined in RFC 4226, the HP the HOTP algorithm is based on the HMAC SHA-1 algorithm and applied to an increasing counter value representing the message in the HMAC computation. So basically, the output of the HMAC SHA-1 calculation is truncated to obtain user-friendly values. There's an equation for you to look at. Uh, truncate represents a function that can convert an HMAC SHA-1 value to an HOTP value. Now, TOTP is the time-based variant of this algorithm where a value T derived from a time reference and a time step replaces the counter. So this is a good moment for you to pause and write down the difference between TOTP and HOTP. If you want more details for that though, right here, TOTP implementations may use HMAC SHA-256 or uh, 512 functions. And anytime I read Shaw or say it out loud, I think of Shaw from the um, cool show Person of Interest, one of my favorite shows. So that's the difference between the two algorithms. Remember, this uh, RFC we're reading is about an extension to the first one. Here in section three, they're going to talk about the algorithm requirements. 
first the prover, that is the token or soft co token, and verifier, the authentication or validation server, we'll eventually just call it server, they must know or be able to derive the current Unix time. And so my question, second question, what is Unix time? It says right here, the number of seconds elapsed since midnight UTC of January 1st, 1970. Really interesting. I wish I had a Unix clock for my nightstand. But my first question up here is like, what two things are needing to know this Unix time? Well, you could say the prover and the verifier. Oh, and let me show you something cool about Unix time. If you go to DuckDuckGo and type that in, you'll get it right there. So pay attention, 8749. If I click, I clicked it again. It's not 8749 anymore. I'll click it again, new number. I thought that was pretty cool. Go ahead and try that out on Google and see if it works. Well, I'll save you time, it doesn't. Well, R2, the R for requirement, uh, the prover and verifier must either share the same secret or the knowledge of a secret transformation to generate a shared secret. Uh, the requirement number three, the algorithm must use HOTP as a key building block. So they're using the word must there. Requirement four, the prover and verifier must use the same time step value X, that is obvious. I think uh, this one's obvious as well. Yes, things should be randomly generated from a key derivation algorithm. And requirement number seven is kind of funny. The keys may be stored in a tamper resistant device and should be protected against unauthorized access and usage. So let's talk about the TOTP algorithm. This is a variant of the HOTP algorithm and it specifies a calculation of a one-time password value based on a representation of the counter as a time factor. So this made me stop and pause and kind of think about that word variant. Variant could be a thing where there's just an addition to it or a tiny like subtraction and addition. So it's sort of like a kind of reminds me of a patch well, oh, that one simple paragraph uh, is the first part of section four. Uh, second part of section four talks about notation. So pay attention to this if you want to read the equations. Here we have the description of the algorithm. Uh, this is the best part for me. The implementation of this algorithm must support a time value t larger than a 32-bit integer when it is beyond the year 2038. So check that out because Unix time is crazy. That's why it says the end of an epoch in the year 2038. We can no longer show seconds after January 1st, 1970. We run out of room. So that's section four. Section five, security considerations. Uh, general, skip down to this part. The analysis will demonstrate that the best possible attack against this HOTP function is the brute force attack. Skip down to this next section. It says all the communications should take place over a secure channel, for example, SSL. So before you start authenticating with this username and password with the token requirement using this algorithm, um, you'll need to use a secure transport layer. Section 5.2, validation and time step size. The time step size has an impact on both security and usability. A larger time step size means a larger valid window for an OTP to be accepted by a validation system. So your one-time password should be relatively uh, limited. There are pros and cons to the size that you decide. Right, security is always a balance between security and convenience or ease of use, you could say. Making the user try again is, you know, not not an example of ease of use. And they say as much right here. There are implications for using larger time step sizes. They're going to tell you a little bit about it, but right here, they recommend a default time step size of 30 seconds. So I'm like, you're the boss. Let's go ahead and just go with the default. These are professionals that write the RFCs, right? Well, a user must wait until the clock moves to the next time step window from the last submission. You know, if the first one doesn't work and um, I make the joke, users just love waiting. So that's something else you will have to be considering with your um, window size. Too large a window, for example, 10 minutes most probably won't be a suitable uh, suitable for typical internet login use cases. They want you to note that a prover may send the same OTP inside a given time step window multiple times to a verifier and the verifier must not accept the second attempt of the OTP after the successful validation has been issued for the first OTP. So this ensures one-time only use of a one-time password. 
Now, section six talks about resynchronization because uh, there's possible clock drifts. And I thought it was neat right here. Upon successful validation, the validation server can record the detected clock drift for the token in terms of the number of time steps. So once a server knows the clock drift of the user, they can keep an eye out for that user. Why did I almost say loser? It's okay if your clock has drifted. You're not a loser. But they warn here that automatic resynchronization described above may not work if the drift exceeds the allowed threshold. So I take it back, you're a loser if you're beyond that threshold. Or at least you'll be losing the ability to become authenticated. So here's a bunch of references, but we're not done yet. <laughs> they reference Wikipedia. How many times have you heard teachers tell you that is not a professional or academic citation? But yeah, we're not done here because now we have some code to read. And our code comes from Java, as you can see by those libraries being imported. And I'm not sure how to excitingly read code. I did think it might be humorous to drop a picture relating to a part of the code. So if you want to pause here, kind of read through, try to figure out why I put a picture right there. I'm going to scroll down a little so you can look at the second picture here. Pause, try to figure it out. It'd be cool if you wrote what you think it is the code excerpt in the comments below but here we go keep going going through the code try to spice it up with these pictures it's interesting how commented out this code is maybe because it is a professional context the rfc itself i don't think we regularly see this type of a commented out code in your typical github hub repository so let's keep on going. Uh, we're almost close to our last picture. I thought this one was pretty funny. So pause and read the code. Type your answer below in the comments. Uh, this part, sorry it's so ugly. If it was on the command line instead of Google Docs, it'd probably look better. And this one. Yes, it's my final uh, code picture. I mean, just look at this. How does this relate to the combination of those two pictures from above? So with that said, this was a TODR of RFC. 6238. Appendix B is just test vectors. You can read the following values for specified modes and timestamps if you wanted. Real exciting. And as promised, here's the end where you have the email addresses of the authors. You send them a message and tell them somebody on YouTube is but butchering their work. <laughs> Get it, butcher, and I showed some steak. Well, till next time, guys. Thank you for watching.